On the panel today, I'm joined by Amali White, who's head of BPO APAC for SSNC, Stephen Davison, who's Chief Transformation Officer at Australian Retirement Trust, and Jennifer Shaw, who's Director in the Superannuation Practice at Deloitte. Thank you all for joining me again. Hi, Great to be here. Amalia, can I start with you in terms of looking out? Clearly with the war for talent, um, historically our processes have been probably excessively manual mm -hmm. and relied on a lot of paper documentation. The future surely is straight through processing and automation. How are we going to make that happen in these bigger mega funds? Yeah, great question, Martin. I think uh, one of the things, uh, Australia tends to be quite insular in terms of how it's looking at, at, it, at itself, um, although has some of the greatest technologies available. So it's kind of this, this paradox that we find ourselves in. Uh, I think um, looking outside, particularly superannuation, looking outside industry, what is best practice, uh, you know, We've focused largely on member administration where we can drive efficiencies there. The same should apply to investment operations and investment capability as well. So um, you know, for SSNC, we enable 20% of the world's wealth through our software platforms and transacting through that. So that's a big driver and a big focus for us. Uh, and it's really critical. I don't think you can leave that off the radar. It's the, it's the right blend of um, cognitive intelligence, AI, uh, RPA, uh, and people. Can, can I follow through on the investment landscape? Mm -hmm. You know, 25 years ago, most superannuation funds held listed equities, but we've seen this enormous, if you like, rotation to alternatives, whether it's private capital and buyout funds, but increasingly real assets in the form of not just real estate, but infrastructure, right across healthcare, transport, energy, etc. How big a challenge are those unlisted assets for the investment technologies, or has the technology evolved and kept up to date with it? I would say not quite. I think um, from a from an asset management point of view, again, if we look at if we need to look globally, uh, we're going to be investing more globally, uh, and so we need the technology to be able to support that, uh, do that safely, and do that well. Can I ask you, Jennifer, obviously all of this means more data. We've got more data about the assets that we own. We've got more real-time processing going on to custodians, sub-custodians, investment managers. We've got internal investment teams. Does this mean that data vulnerabilities and cybers now needs to be at the forefront of what we're doing? I think definitely. I mean, I think the superannuation industry in general has been a target of late for the, you know, the value of the assets in the sector. The relatively low engagement amongst customers, which means that it's more open to cyber attacks. As the data increases and as the funds increase, then you expect that that would only increase further. Um, and I think there are some steps that we've already seen funds taken in the market. There's different maturities there. Um, so things around, you know, tried and tested processes in place. So if something was to happen, make sure that everyone has a consistent view of the response to that. Um, there's also other services, you know, outside of the super funds. So threat intelligence, understanding what's happening across the globe and how is that relevant to super funds and almost being proactive with your membership. Um, but I think at, at, over the next, you know, five years, I can see that being a massive focus area for the super funds. Stephen, in terms of the next five years, clearly the priorities as you move through and beyond the initial frantic standing up the new organization, standing up the new operating model, there are longer term changes that you're trying to embed in longer term projects and aspirations. What's on the agenda for you as Chief Transformation Officer at Australian Retirement Trust over the next 18, 24 months? What are you looking to achieve? Yeah, thanks, Martin. I think change is inevitable. We're experiencing that around us, uh, both socially and professionally. So we need to make sure that the right change is done at the right time and be really clear on who's benefiting from that change. Transformation could be long running and enduring, but that's if you do a lot of work with yourself and lose focus of what's most important. It might be responding to changing regulatory needs. It might be responding to you know the cyber threats that are emerging at the moment, but ultimately it has to be what's in the best interest of members and really challenging yourself to look at your systems, look at your process, where are those opportunities to return some benefits back to members in the forms of services or fee reductions? And in terms of the, the services, you know, obviously you've got a digital a, a agenda that's going to run forward. Will the focus of that digital agenda be primarily on the member in the accumulation phase and in the retirement phase, or do you see other aspects to that digitization agenda? I think digitization has to factor in all parts of the equation, all members of the value chain, whether it be advisors, our stakeholders, whether it, you know, government uh, offices, business to business. We also have to make sure we support the members. Members expect it now. 
you know, in our, in our world as consumers, we interact digitally with just about all parts of our life. Why should super be any different to that? So we need to make sure the digital solutions are there for all uh, parts of uh, our, our fund. Looking forward to Molly, obviously, you know, the, the levy review is going to have final report on December 16th. That set out some really big aspirations for change in advice. We've spent three decades in accumulation. Many of these new funds are now finding more and more of the fund and the members are in the drawdown phase and in the retirement phase. We've had the retirement income covenant. What, what do you see happening in the, in the technology space in that area? And, and, and what are SS&C thinking about technology in the retirement space? Will it have the same impact it's had in accumulation? I think it should. Uh, I think absolutely it's the right it's the right space to be focusing on, um, both from a, a technology and service proposition uh, point of view, for sure. Uh, and I think it will follow. So in terms of SS&C's focus, um, a member administration has been our focus and, and you know, creating a nimble core registry, which is not, you know, not easy. How do we replicate that across uh, other, other components of the value chain, to Steve's point? And I think it's not just, we're not just obligated to members, we're obligated to our people for this as well. You know, uh, technologists really want to work on something that's new and exciting and that delivers value. Uh, and so, you know, we, we should be striving for that. It's, uh, it'll benefit all in the end. Jennifer, a big part of the agenda going forward has going to be the decarbonisation, not just of the economy, but obviously of the investment portfolios. The government set aside $36 million in the, in the back of the budget for looking at reporting of carbon intensity across the economy. Is reporting carbon going to be important as, you know, will we unitise carbon as much as we unitise the, the user balance and the member balance? I think community expectations will require it. I mean, I think you're already seeing movements in the market around what people are actually looking for from their super funds. Um, and definitely, you know, performance reporting, people will be keen to understand not only what's that nominal return that I'm receiving, but what impact has that had on the environment? And, you know, am I comfortable with them um, being part of this super fund and are they doing their bit? Amali, within your international clients, particularly in the investment operations and, and the investment uh, management technology, are you seeing a greater focus on reporting around ESG and in particular carbon intensity? Absolutely. Uh, and Australia follows that global trend. And I think, you know, we, we've been measured in the super industry on member outcomes, but we should really expect to see some carbon, outcome, uh, carbon outcomes uh, built into that moving forward. Stephen, can I ask, in terms of that transformation agenda, where's ESG sitting in the priorities? And, and in particular, you know, what, are the, what do you think are the impacts of this big reporting and compliance burden going to be around ESG? Is it going to be front and center or is it something that we're just going to normalize into our activities? I think we have to look at normalizing it into activities. Um, it is important to members, it's important to our stakeholders. And I think we have a responsibility on behalf of our 2 million members, over 2 million members, and the, the money that we invest on behalf of them needs to consider this important social topic. In terms of, of you know, Australian Retirement Trust reporting its carbon footprint, obviously ASX companies now have an obligation every year to report. How soon do you think before, you know, as a, as a member, when I open my statement, I'll be able to see not just the balance on my account, but the carbon intensity of, of the uh, of, of the fund? You touched on data before, and I think that's one of the things the industry will grapple with is how to make sure that all the right data is used for granular reporting like that, collecting, making it easy, making it are easily understood by the members is also really important. And then storing that, using it, uh, and making sure that we're collecting it through technology rather than putting extra burden on the business. We've talked, Jennifer, a lot about big funds, but clearly the year future, year super test, while it's under review, it's going to be part of the landscape going forward. The trend to mega funds is going to continue. Do, do you think that there's a, a place out there for smaller, nimble, more differentiated funds? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting, actually, actually, some of the regulatory language that's been used of late. So we've obviously had a couple of years of the performance test, and we've had some mergers that have definitely been a result of that through license conditions, etc. However, some of the language has changed a lot more to the sustainability point. So it's not, you know, only looking at the performance test. If you're failing performance test, you need to merge up. It's actually a wider consideration of sustainability. And for me, I think that stretches even beyond some of those APRA metrics that you that you look at, but all, just thinking, you know, for some of these smaller funds, are they able to, um, you know, provide certain services at an efficient cost? Um, and I think that will be the telltale sign of then where these funds go in the future. Well, can I ask in terms of other sectors, people get the benefits of scale by moving to the cloud, using single global instance where multiple organizations obviously can leverage the underlying infrastructure, whether it's AWS or Azure, 
or indeed an implementation of, of the sort of systems that, that SSNC provides. How quickly do you think smaller funds will move to that? Historically, we've tended to see them want to be on-prem with a customized edition. Surely they need to move to vanilla out of the box at scale global deployments. Yeah, and actually surprisingly, there, there are uh, some smaller funds who do and have, have been more effective and more nimble at it than, than some of the medium to large funds, uh, which is great to see. And, that, you know, references my comment um, in the first session around, you know, we should, through SFT should really be looking at the capabilities that exist uh, and what's viable to bring forward. Stephen, in terms of where you see the, the, the expansion internationally, obviously as, as, as ART, like other funds, grows out internationally, deploys more capital internationally, and new people join the organization, how do you inculcate that new culture um, into those people joining so that you can you know, have culture carriers as the organization inevitably expands out and starts to get bigger? Yeah, thanks, Martin. I think it's a challenge for all businesses, not only superannuation. We're in a flexible work environment. So our workforce is distributed, and that's really important, and that's a critical part of our future. ART worked hard on culture prior to the merger, and we established what, what is our cultural aspirations and our culture behaviours. And so that's our North Star. That's what brings you to work. That's what gets us through the difficult days, and we reinforce that at every opportunity. Jennifer, can I ask you in terms of what's the difference between a $500 billion fund and a $50 billion fund in reality? Does a member experience a difference? Is it just about the fees and costs or is there are there other things that can happen at, at those scale levels? Yeah, I think there are de definitely um, impacts throughout the full member life cycle. So from the joining process, from the, the lifestyle that we have, I think one of the, the other key points is the investments piece as well, because you know with some of these larger funds, the access to alternative investment opportunities, um, feeding that through into the investment performance, um, is obviously a major consideration for members as well. So I think there, there is definitely differences um, between some of the smaller funds and the larger funds. Um, I guess the other key point is tailoring your uh, approach to your membership as well. Molly, final question to you. Two big trends that are going to dominate the, the tech and system space in superannuation over the next five years. What are you calling out as two big trends? I think it's probably the same ones that have um, uh, we've seen in, in other industries and super has just been a little bit um, slower to come to market uh, as usual. I think it's um, it's bringing up your probably your investment capabilities to align with your member facing capabilities, certainly automation uh, and I think also offshoring and looking global and, and um, you know, having a more global operating model. There you have it, a future where technology is going to play an increasingly important role, but also the issues of ESG and the carbon footprints of our funds. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists, Amali White, who is head of BPO for APAC for SSNC, Steve Davison, who is Chief Transformation Officer of Australian Retirement Trust, and Jennifer Shaw, who is a director in the superannuation practice at Deloitte. I'd also like to thank SSNC for their support in this webinar. If you want to hear more about these types of topics, please feel free to join us at the ASPA conference, 21st to the 23rd of February in Brisbane, where we'll be unpacking more of these issues, where you'll have a chance to catch up with face to face with all of our panelists and put your questions to them, both in the exhibition hall, but also in the parallel sessions where we'll unpack more of these topics. I'm Martin Fahey, CEO of ASPA. Thank you for joining me.